Clifton Beach, I think, years ago. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Right, Friday. Good morning. Welcome to the Proactive Health Active. Collective of Keene. Here we are ganging up on you again with our <laughs> opinions and advice and but lots of laughter, fun, and hopefully you enjoy it as much as we do. And uh, so welcome, we're glad to have you. Uh, today, we're going to be Allison Millar, um, acupuncture, acupuncturist of uh, basic balance here in Keene is on her way. She is finishing up with a patient um, at this very moment. So she'll be with us shortly. But we've been talking in recent programs about detoxification. Uh, we started out beginning in, in January with addiction, and we have a lot of addictive problems today, um, and they're, they're getting worse with uh, the things that have been going on in the last year. Uh, we know that there's been an uptick in, in addictive behaviors. We also know uh, that detoxification is important all the time. We live in a very toxic world, and I think today what we want to do is kind of finish up that topic and we'll come back to it because it's always a problem with a little bit more focus on some of the toxins that people don't realize they're exposed to just in daily life that can really make a big, big difference over time in this toxic load. And it's responsible for a lot of problems. A lot of the weight problems we have with people today is due to toxicity. And it's not due to just calories, you ate too much, you didn't exercise enough. We have factors happening in our bodies all the time that we're not aware of. And so part of our goal here as a group of practitioners is to make you help make us all aware of these things and how we can avoid them, how we can cleanse from them. And my focus today when I talk about that is going to be what we know as um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. And these are behind, there's a really, um, a practitioner here, she's author of a new book. Her name is uh, Bonnie Nedro. She's a naturopath and she has re, uh, published a recent book, Metabolic Flexibility, How to Use a Ketogenic Diet to Heal Your Metabolism. And I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but she focuses, she talks quite a bit about these endocrine uh, disrupting chemicals uh, interact with estrogen receptors to contribute to obesity in both men and women and she's gonna talk about how this is happening to children in utero because of their exposure during the fetal development time and how this is really a huge factor in childhood obesity. This is things people aren't aware of and um, we gotta be aware so we know what to do about it. So anyway, that's my intro. Awesome. You know, um, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I know in, in my many years of practice, number one and number two on the list of things that are people are concerned about are weight and energy. And, you know, above cancer and autoimmune disease, you know, when, when they hierarchy, what's important, weight is one of those things. And, and, you know, when it comes to weight, like you mentioned, Becky, there's hormonal stuff, toxicity, just in that the body will, you know, store chemicals in the fat stores to protect itself. So that, that's another way. And then, you know, um, there's the, you could call it a toxicity in a way, but it is the toxicity of stress because when we're in stress mode, you know, it's, it's a, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a, it's a built-in short-term mechanism, but over long-term, it actually becomes toxic to us. And, you know, in something like the pregnant alone steel, where you're basically converting your cholesterol, your pregnant alone to stress hormones versus going to you know, your sex hormones and, wow. and, and it sets up, um, you know, it sets up a chemical imbalance, which is essentially like a toxicity. So that toxic, those toxic thoughts translate to a toxic internal environment, which will actually deteriorate your immune system, cause you to hold weight. I mean, it's, it's just a cascade of things. So like we think of toxicities as just the mercury and the aluminum and the petroleum solvents and the pesticides, but it also, we can create a toxic chemistry within our body based on our thoughts and how we're experiencing the world. Mm. Yeah, so I love that that yeah, really great. And I, I think a really important point there is how that builds up over time. Right, because it is, it's not, you know, it's built in short-term mechanism. You're being chased by the saber-toothed tiger. You're either gonna make it or you're not, right? <laughs> and then it's over. 
But if every night you lay awake in your cave thinking about the saber tooth tiger, now you're creating a toxic environment in your body. <laughs> right. Sense. And and we might say that, you know, do we have saber tooth tigers on the landscape nowadays? You know? Yeah, well, everybody's got their own saber tooth tiger, right? Yeah, right. So it's like the literal and the figurative. We sort of like put those two camps. But yeah, the truth is that the modern day saber tooth tiger is very real and it's, you know, it's perpetual and a hyper vigilant state that never goes away. Nervous system's always cranked. It's always in that state. And this stuff really builds up. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. since we're building on this theme here, when we're in that state, again, our energy and our focus is in survival. And it's taken away from other body processes, including the, the ability to detoxify. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. takes energy to detoxify, to deal with just, you know, and, and of course we're living in a fairly you know, unnatural environment or certainly an overwhelming chemical environment. And that stress piece, the body says, well, right now we can't deal with that. We're busy with this. And if we stay busy with that, we can never get to this um, efficiently. And again, that just compounds the amount, not only amount of, on the amount of toxicity that we have coming in, but the body's ability to keep up with it. And so it just becomes a negative, um, you know, going in a negative direction. Yeah. yeah. And one of the big things that happens when people are under stress is their digestion is affected. And now you might be suffering from constipation. And if you can't move your bowels efficiently, you can't clear toxins. There are so many toxins that really come out in stool. Um, and so when you're constipated, you've got this stool sitting in your colon and it's, you, these toxins are being reabsorbed. So just even that part of things, if you're under stress, if you're running from the saber tooth tiger, you are not going to stop and poop, right? That's all going to shut down so that you can run. And that's one of digestion and elimination, I think is one of those big organ systems that suffers from stress, chronic stress. Yeah. Well, the whole not only the detox, but the whole digestive system in general, you know, again, if you're in that fit, fight or flight physiology, your body's saying, well, we don't have time for this right now. That includes digestion of food and, you know, taking your nutrients, which then are used for all processes, including detoxification. Uh, it's a whole thing. It's, it's the whole yeah. system really is shutting down. And, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, how many people out there have had that moment where it's like, you got to go to the bathroom, but don't have time. Got to step up, got to keep moving, you know, like, nope, that would be rude, you know? And so yeah. what happens is people put it off and they put it off and then the whole system just kind of says, okay, well, forget it. <laughs> yeah. You didn't pay attention to me, so I'm not going to bother you again, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, come come yes. back with a vengeance. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> oh boy <laughs> that's why i think it's really important that you know that um yeah you've got to listen to those thing those signals from your body but uh i don't i think people don't realize uh, just normal things that they're doing that plastic container you're drinking from that makeup you're putting on your face that sunscreen um the pesticide laden foods um that have these xenoestrogens we have big, big um, sources of many, many sources of hormonal disruptors. And they're very toxic. This woman, um, Dr. Nedro says, we've known that endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs, interact with estrogen receptors to contribute to obesity in both men and women. Then a subclass of EDCs was discovered that promotes obesity via additional pathways. This includes the peroxisome pro proliferator activated receptor gamma pathway. Um, these are PPARGs, okay, for our acronyms. Well, thankfully, um, environmental chemicals can drive those. The PPARG obesogenic pathway as early as development in utero. When cells are omnipotent and can differentiate into either connective tissue cells or fat cells, they respond, so connective tissue would be like muscle, right? And other cartilage, bone, all of that. Or fat cells, they respond to environmental cues. Under the influence of obesogens, an increased number of cells in the developing fetus, developing fetus are permanently programmed to be fat cells. This causes increased fat storage capacity and increased hunger. Sadly, we are starting to see the fastest growing percentage of obesity in infants. Um, 
It's huge. Yeah, not surprising. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting with pregnancy, a lot of times when people come and they, they're, you know, their desire is like, well, we've been trying to get pregnant. And so it can help us get pregnant. And, you know, my first thought is, well, I think you want to clean up your environment. You know, your body, you might not be getting pregnant because it is in the right environment. And let's, you know, let's step back a, a step and look at that first, because whatever, you know, it's like fish in a pond. I mean, mm -hmm. mom is the pond and little baby is the fish, right? So whatever is in the pond, it, your fish is living in that pond. So, um, yeah, you know, toxins absolutely going to affect a, a growing fetus. Yeah. Or the ability to have one. I'm just going to continue this little bit. Um, welcome, Allison. Yay, all right. Wondrous Allison. Um, the chemical and metabolic programming that occurs during development is like the hardware. That's permanent. As clinicians, we need to modulate that hardware with some software. We do that with the diet and detoxification. Also, the same obesogenic chemicals that influence development can promote weight gain when exposure happens later in life. Chemicals like BPA, bisphenol A, phthalates, which you know we find a lot in cosmetics and lotions and things like that, and gly glyphosate, which is something that's huge, and we have we could focus on that too and organ organophosphate pesticides. Those are the estrogen mimickers. Stimul stimulate fat cells for storage instead of mobilization. My last paragraph. The transgenerational influence of environmental toxicity is part of the reason why we see an exponential, not linear, rise in obesity rates. Babies are programmed for obesity before they are born and then burdened with more chemical exposure through their childhood and into adulthood. The only way to turn this around is to address both detoxification and metabolic flexibility head on. Very well said, I think. So check out the, her book. And I love that when we start talking about metabolic flexibility, I mean, we're talking about basically allow, uh, offering a new input to the system so that it can start to adapt and move in a different direction. If it, if it has a certain program, it literally needs to be upgraded. So that it can be more efficient, well said, yeah. um, and we have lots of ways to do that. Yeah, well said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One thing that we didn't touch on last time, and it's not really about toxins in the environment as much as a lack of what's in the environment, is soil depletion. Mm -hmm. So there is. It was. When was I wrote it down? Yeah, 1855. There is a German chemist made an experiment and. He found that you only needed three minerals in the soil, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And so they kind of ran with that. And that's sort of what the whole agriculture system's like based on. And there's actually 92 trace minerals that are lacking in our soil. And even organic soil really does not have that. And these enzymes are so important for enzymatic processes in our body, like creating hormones and antioxidants and so many important ones in our immune system that we just, or even blood sugar regulation, so many things that we're not getting. So like you were saying, like we're kind of, we don't have, we're not firing an all full, all four cylinders from the start. So yeah. And people will say to me, well, I eat a balanced diet. Can I get all my nutrients from food? And I'm, I'm like, well, ideally you could. Um, yeah. Ideally, but our soils are so deficient. Exactly what you're saying, Allison. Uh, you're not. What used to be an apple is now a quarter of an apple, nutrition-wise. Um, right. Jennifer, um, oh gosh, who worked for me. Um, she's, was a, she worked in agriculture. She did a lot of work. Um, Jennifer Close in this area. She was out at, uh, did a lot of work out at the, um, the farm in Alstead and all of that. And they were doing a lot of this experimentation with, with um, checking the soils, correcting the soils and rechecking. And there, that's a whole um, bright future if people proceed with this. But she said, basically it would be like, you would be able to, this sounds a little far-fetched, but in today's day and age, I don't know, but you could go in and you could actually read on your phone the nutrient, like you could pick up a tomato in the produce section and have this app on your phone that would actually read out to you hmm. the, the potency and, the, and what 
the actual constituents of that is and compare, you know, compare wow. one to this or that. I mean, that would be pretty cool. Why it's not? Pretty, pretty sad that we need to do that. But Allison, like you said, organic means that we don't have the crap in there, the pesticides and the toxins. It doesn't say anything about the quality of the soil being any better. Um, yeah. And then you know, for a lot of the lack, they'll fortify foods with synthetically created, you know, supplements and things like that. And then you have something that's made in the laboratory. And when you do that chemically, you're going to get 50% of the of the structure of the chemical that works with your body. And then 50% of that's going to be the opposite isomere. And so that's going to be treated as a toxin in your body. And you're going to have to filter that out through your kidneys. Hmm. And that's why a lot of, you know, a lot of synthetically made vitamins are actually really toxic to your system. Right. You yeah. are not a lab rat. <laughs> <laughs> or you are, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it reminds me of a story. I used to tell this story a lot when I would do a, you know, like a presentation, I would, when I was, um, I don't know, when I was a kid, you know, we, we grew these tomatoes in the garden and, and they were just so delicious and we would make sandwiches out of them or just eat them. Um, and I remember one day going to the store, this was, uh, I had just graduated from chiropractic school and I went to the, the store and I saw these tomatoes and they looked really nice. And I, and I was like, I, my mind went back to when I was a kid, I was thinking about them and and my mouth is watering. I get them home and <clears throat> pull them out. I don't even put the rest of the groceries away. I'm going to make a tomato sandwich right away. And then I taste this tomatoes and it's like, tasted like cardboard. And I was like, mm -hmm. this is not what I remember. And so a really good, uh, you know, your own, if you don't have the app, so to speak, if you taste, you know, your food and it doesn't taste vibrant and full and, you know, rich, uh, you're probably missing a few things in there. But the other thing we need to consider with the soil is not just what it's lacking um, and not just the pesticides that they're spraying on it, but even I was, I've been listening, um, I listen to stuff all the time, but, um, I was listening to a video this week. They were talking about, you know, what they're spraying in the air and, you know, they're doing weather, weather modification and that kind of stuff. And there's heavy metals and there's different things that comes down into the soil. And that can also have a, a major effect, you know, if we're talking about soil toxicity and, um, you know, how that affects our plants and nutrients and all that. So. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. You get you're saying that I had a conversation with a practice member who um, who works for a bread company and um, we were he was saying, you know, he was like, I think we're missing the whole fact that that what we're putting on our food as opposed to what the food is, because he's like, it seems like it's been so easy to just well, all these problems and stipulations are coming from gluten. It's gluten. That's the problem and all this stuff, he's like, it's just, I don't think people realize that it's, it's what is being sprayed on the wheat, you know, that goes into the plant. And, and we're, we're actually kind of looking at it. Gluten is like the effect, not the cause, you know, and just like we have lack of energy and we have tension in our system is the effect, not the cause, you know, and when it comes to like trying to figure out what's really going on with our system. And it's easier to blame just one thing instead of try and totally change the entire process of how we make and distribute and, and grow our food, right? Yeah, and So, but speaking about the wheat and the gluten, of course, um, the wheat that is the most modern wheat that's in most of our food and which is responsible for all this gluten problem is dwarf wheat, which is genetically modified which uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for somebody for solving world hunger by developing, by hybriding wheat so that it can withstand, it's, it's short, it doesn't care if it's sunny or, or whatever, it's gonna grow. Um, this wheat has seven times more gluten activity than the original einkorn wheat of 2000 years, 12,000 years ago. So we're talking, we have, again, the gluten problem, is shouldn't be in wheat as wheat varieties should be. Um, it's because we've modified the wheat and we've changed it. And so now we have so people who go travel who are gluten sensitive. I'm not talking celiac because celiac is a true, truly different severe entity, but most people who are gluten sensitive do not have celiac. So I've had clients that they go, 
for friends, you know, they travel, they're gluten sensitive here in the United States, they go to Europe, they go to Italy, they go here, they go there, they eat bread every day, they have no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, again, we have made, we keep making monsters, we keep saying we're solving problems, while we're not, we're creating more problems. More. And um, that's just that, uh, you know, the, clo the, the, the closest um, example we have of that is COVID. Um, and, and we've just taken this and we've alarmed people and we're just creating more problems, these so-called vaccines, which are not vaccines. And people, if you're thinking a COVID vaccine is a vaccine, it's not, it's a, it's a totally different technology. And we are creating more health problems while we're saying we're solving a problem. And this is what we're famous for. I mean, this is what we do and it's sickening because with all of our modern developments that are supposedly supposed to improve everybody's state and, and quality of life, we are doing exactly the opposite. Yes, absolutely. And Allison, I loved what you said. I mean, going back to the 1850s, you know, when we started to extrapolate, you know, what these major constituents are and that ultimately you could look at the cascade all the way to these modern technologies, like you said, Becky, that, you know, we're um, parading under these different banners and whatnot. And um, just to look at, you know, so what ends up being missed, you know, because it's really easy now we're bombarded with so much. There's so many like boogeymen out there, basically. Um, and that's, you know, while we need to take action toward these things, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to continue to roll. So looking at the health of the host itself, in other words, like you and your own body, your own life, um, you know, and that's why this topic of toxicity is so important. Because if you look at, I mean, how, you said what, there were like 90 trace minerals or something like that, that would be, yeah. 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 So, I mean, contributing to, you know, just even the experience of eating a tomato, right, Gene, like from really, really good soil. And then imagine the nutrient density of that tomato. Imagine the antioxidants. Imagine what that's actually doing for the body and how that's improving the host. So if we look at toxicity then as a toxic load, a total toxic load from the environment, from our stress response, I mean, even from, you know, our mental and emotional landscapes, of course, um, we can start to see that stacking the deck in a positive direction could have some really serious proactive benefits. Yeah, and most people aren't, aren't really that aware. I mean, I had a, I was doing a consult last night and, you know, really nice lady and we were talking and I'm like, well, there's things that you're probably not aware of. And, you know, I said, well, you know, do you have silver amalgam fillings? She said, yeah, I got a mouthful. I said, mm -hmm. well, has anybody ever you know, asked you about that or talked about that, that that might be what's affecting your thyroid. And I said, what about, <clears throat> I can smell that you're wearing perfume. What about that? Have you considered perfumes that they're chemical toxins? And I, I, I told her a story when, when I was a kid, I liked the way my mom's perfume smelled. And so I figured it would probably taste good. And so I actually sprayed it into my mouth and I found out really quickly <laughs> that it tasted nothing like it smelled. Uh, but I remember that, uh, but there's so much, and, and I, I talk about that concept of like, look, you know, it, it's not about walking on eggshells and you're not gonna get away from it all. We're all sitting here in front of computers right now, right? So we're not, you know, there's, there's, we're an environment. And so we do have to upgrade our systems. We have to work more efficiently. And, you know, that comes in a lot of ways, not only in, you know, handling our stress or, you know, handling our nerve system and trying to, to do the right things as far as how we're eating, um, but just being, you know, increasing your level of awareness and I don't know, it's like, it's either you're heading in the wrong direction or you're heading in the right direction. You're not here or there. It's just a continuum of, can I make better and healthier decisions? Can I have more awareness? Can I have more awareness of my body. Can I have more awareness of what I put in my body? Can I have more awareness of, you know, what's happening in our government and are they going to allow 5g and to keen and, you know, there's, it's kind of overwhelming um, in a little bit of a way, but uh, I think, you know, collectively, it's something that we have to start paying attention to because of all those, you know, those plans that are made, call it central planning, right? It's like, oh, this is a good idea. We'll create a new road here. And then it, then it, we find a new problem because of that. And, you know, we make gluten or we, we have this pesticide that solves one problem that causes another problem. I think it's getting back to more natural ways, more natural laws that sort of um, 
are congruent or work in harmony with, with um, our own internal ecosystems and our external ecosystems as well. Yeah. Shows, yeah, the really agree. Shows the importance, like you're both saying, about getting your information for yourself and not just listening to the loudest voice. You know, I think the whole gluten-free thing has gotten so much movement because there's so many marketing schemes now, gluten-free and those, a lot of those products have extraordinary amounts of sugar and other additives that are not any healthier. They're just different types of toxicities. Um, totally. People think they're eating healthy, like, oh, I'm eating healthy. And I look at their thing and it's like gluten-free this, gluten-free that. It's like, you know, I appreciate what you're doing here, but mm, I wouldn't exactly call that healthy. You know, that's, it's maybe gluten-free, but you know. I was reading um, this little book I've been getting into standard process supplements. I think the company is really cool. So I've been learning a little bit about them. They have a little book they put out and um, what they were saying. So there was, so Dr. Wiley at one point was ahead of the Bureau of Chemistry, which nowadays is the FDA. And he was like, he was all about like the health of the consumer and ethical sort of things for the country. He actually wanted to sue Coca-Cola for the extraordinary amount, like to keep it off the market. It's probably when they had like cocaine or whatever, maybe just the sugar in it, but he was all about the health of the, of keeping America healthy. But then he was replaced with Dr. Elmer Nelson and he was very commercially backed by a lot of these industries. And he actually he would block the, what they say in the book, he blocked health food manufacturers from comparing the quality of their products to their synthetic processed counterparts. So he went to court and he claimed that, you know, his testimony was that he said, it's unscientific to state that a well-fed body is more able to resist disease. So, you know, A, there was tons of information at that point, evidence-based like Western price and can we just can we just stop for just a moment, Allison? Like, and just acknowledge how ridiculous that is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's common sense, you know, and to say there's no evidence of that, and so of course, from that point on, with this person is in charge of the FDA, which is getting to say, you know, basically making all the decisions on our products, our food products, what ingredients you can and can't have what the, um, the advertisements on them can claim. And so you're getting all of this additives, all these synthetic chemicals and things are getting bleached and refined and artificially colored and hydrogenated and basically just exposed to all of these man-made chemicals. So yeah. One of my mentors and, and I'm sure Dr. Zabatelli would uh, know this guy, Dr. Reggie Gold. Um, he used to speak a lot about inductive and, and deductive reasoning and, you know, your inductive reasoning and, and there's a place for both, you know, your inductive reasoning is, is your science, the way you're putting together the pieces and, you, you know, so that's where you're, oh, well, there's no science that says that chemicals are bad for your body. And then there's deductive reasoning where you sort of take a major premise and from there you make logical conclusions like, well, it seems to me that things that come natural seem to be better for the body and things that are synthetic seem not to be. And, you know, you can base conclusions using both inductive and deductive reasoning, but a lot, I think in our society, we've become so on the inductive side without realizing the pitfalls of it because, you know, science is always changing. And so people say, well, I believe in the science. Well, that's great, except science always changes because eggs were proved to be bad and then they were proved to be good and then they were proved to be bad. And then they're, you know, so depending on what study comes out, there's always can be missing information. And um, as well as, uh, you know, I, I think all of us sitting here probably today know that it can be manipulated to come out the way it, it you know, whoever's paying for the study wants it to come out. Yeah. And so there, there's the danger. And just, I think that, you know, for our audience, just you have to marry that. It's, it's science is great. I'm, we're looking at it all the time. I and mean, Becky's bringing stuff to the, you know, she's always reading about science. And we have to marry that science with our own, um, you know, deductive major premise that we follow. And, you know, for us chiropractors, um, 
we believe and understand that this is not, this is a, an organized um, functional, you know, physiology person. And we, we live in an organized functional um, ecosystem that everything is, that everything works harmoniously together. And so when you disrupt that harmony, you can have issues. Yeah, and I just, a really quick point, just understand like for context, the human is wired for novelty. Like you are wired for novelty. We love newness, we love freshness, we love like the next new thing. Like that is so exciting to us. And these marketing conglomerates know that. They know that. So it's important for us to understand that too so we can have a little more discernment. I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> because I got up this morning and I thought, my, um, my zeal for the day, if it's just about keeping up with stuff, it's not that um, inspiring. Mm -hmm. When it's my new idea, I am like, jump out of bed. I am like, yeah. oh, I'm on it. I, I'm gonna, well, how am I going to make that happen? You know, blah, 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 blah. But I, I'm wired that way. If, if it's just keeping up with the status quo, with what's going on in my business or, or in my practice right now, but if it's a new idea, whether it be a formula or a new way to do something, I just love it. You know, it just makes me want to first with zeal. And that's so awesome. And understand how those are kind of two different manifestations of the same thing, right? So we're like looking outside for like the next new thing and like grasping at whatever it is, you know, and that's trying to satisfy that same need, but at a much lower energy state where there's not much inspiration, it's being fed to you versus getting up in a much <clears throat> higher energy state and being so excited about something that's really calling to you and pulling you forward in life. Yeah. Totally different ball game and changes your physiology which completely changes your body's ability to detox and your biochemical response and all those biochemical pathways you were talking about earlier, like night and day. Yeah. Well, that's so perfect because we're going to talk about the heart health here. And what you guys are talking about is the fire element, which the organ is the heart, but it's the spontaneity and newness and, you know, just creativity and no boundaries. The summertime, this is all, this is all fire stuff, which is heart stuff. In Chinese medicine. It's heart health month after all. It is. Yes. And now can I, can I just go back a little bit? Um, Cause Allison, as we were kind of like back and forth email this week, what we're talking about and stuff, we mentioned that we hadn't really brought out that much about glyphosate, mm -hmm. which is probably our biggest toxic enemy today. Yeah, that's a great um, one to talk about. So I just wanna, I was talking about the endocrine disruptor, disruptors. And with glyphosate, we know there's a lot of other things going on. Cancer, that's been proved that, you know, that was one in court about, you know, using Roundup and having cancer. And that was one of those um, kind of um, uh, Brockovich kind of stories. But I mean, this, this was proven and, and um, Monsanto had to pay and all of that. So, but it says in October 2020 paper in Chemosphere Journal, Glyphosate and the key character. Okay, so for people who don't know, glyphosate is the major um, herbicide pesticide they use on agriculture throughout our country, all over the place. It's also found in diesel fuel and all kinds of other places where you're exposed to it. Um, so nobody really gets away from it unless you're super, super pure. Even if your neighbor is doing Roundup on their lawn, um, that's not staying on his lawn or in his air space, it's coming over to you. This is like completely all around us and in our food, Cheerios, um, you know. Mm. Uh, but anyway, uh, a review in the first comprehensive review consolidating the mechanistic evidence on glyphosate as an endocrine disrupting chemical, again, your hormones. The paper concludes that the world's most widely used herbicide meets at least eight of the 10 key characteristics of EDCs as proposed in, a white, in an expert consensus statement published in 2020, new research adds evidence that weed killer glyphosate disrupts hormones. So it goes on. I'm not going to like say that much, but th this is here. And we are doing this. And you know, we give our kids, we try to take such great care of ourselves. We're pregnant. Um, we try to take good care of our kids. We have no idea that the sunscreen we're putting on our pregnant bodies is, is influencing the development of the child. 
We have no idea that the food we're eating that we think is pretty darn good. I'm eating a lot of fruit and veggies or whatever, but you know, what, what's in them, uh, then, uh, yeah, I mean, and then Cheerios, I mean, that's been, that's come out like most of your top brand cereals are from, uh, cereal products that have been, you know, exposed to glyphosate. So we, we are, people are worried about the, a virus. Really? I mean, this is insane. We're killing our population, um, with toxins. You know, it's interesting you say that, like, I, I just, with, with my own personal experience of being pregnant and, um, you know, being very blessed with thus far, you know, feeling good, but I feel like I'm functioning good. And I have to, you know, I have to give you guys credit for this. Um, and I think there should be a, a re requirement, like if you plan to get pregnant, you should do a one-year detox beforehand, you know, or one-year cleansing of just your system. Don't put I, any more, no, don't put any more rules in there. Oh, I'm just ah. saying, I recommend it because <laughs> I've, I've, I'm doing a birthing class and I, and, and a lot of the, the girls who are going through this, the women are like, oh, it was so horrible. I was sick all my first trimester and this was so, and I really do think it has a lot to do with what, what Jean is saying, your, your environment inside, right? And and we did that. We worked with you, Dr. Jean um, and Becky, just, I mean, for the, for the last year. And I really do contribute it to helping cleanse my body and, and feeling good. Like not saying third trimester is a walk in the park by any means, but it's, um, it's a lot. It has so much to do with the nutrition and the, and what your body really needs and being aware of it. And I think it's, it's unfortunate that most people just aren't aware and, and sad. And that's where we're going with this. Like, we're not looking at other pictures. We're just, we're kind of honing in on one thing and focusing on one thing. And I don't know, I just, I'm grateful that we get the opportunity to really share this information because there might be people out there who are planning on, you know, changing some things or trying to change some things in their life and make a difference and they've got options that they may not even be aware of. Yeah. And I would say, uh, I would just only like to say um, that a lot of people who experience profound nausea with pregnancy, it's because of the high level of the HCG. It's not because, so I just want to say as a caveat out there to somebody, if you had nausea with your pregnancy or something, it doesn't mean that you weren't taking good care of yourself um, necessarily. We do know that there are certain things that work really well for um, pregnancy nausea, such as vitamin B6, you know, like 10 milligrams taken with every meal or things like that. So you can really help offset that. But the, the nausea itself, um, I wouldn't say, I would, I would look at more things in pregnancy that uh, are so preventable, but are very common or like preeclampsia. All right. Um, and that is totally due to uh, you know, you know the, the mother's blood pressure goes sky high and all of this kind of stuff. That is totally due to um, nutrient deficit. I mean, preeclampsia is completely preventable, yeah. um, things like that. And your discomfort in the third trimester, I'm sure, is just due to your mass, you know, just dealing with your body mass. Yeah. There's a 15 yes. pound bowling ball <clears throat> right here on my belly. <laughs> but I'll bet, Very weird. I'll bet, I'll bet mentally, I'll bet mentally and spiritually and, and, you know, you feel up, up. I'm just, I have to run for one second. I'll be right back. Yeah. Mary. Up. Well, you know, it's an emotional thing too. So I have that to work with as well. <laughs> yeah. It's all those fun things. It was a great journey. It is. Yeah. So you yeah. were segueing into uh, heart health here, Allison, and the fire. Yeah. And yeah. So real quick, I want to just, um, point out is um, when plants, you know, plants don't produce their own minerals. They absorb what's in the soil. And what, if that's glyphosate, which is Roundup, that's what's in the plant. You know, it's not like they grow and they have all this stuff. It's just, they, they get it from what they have. And if they don't have it, then your body, if the soil doesn't have it, then your body is not getting it. And if your body's malnourished, that's when disease can take over. So, 
but yeah, you can tie that, that up true. and move on. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I thought we, I thought that was a great idea, Tisa, to talk about heart health being National Heart Health Month. Um, yeah. Anyone want to kick that off? Well, I know that what we do, um, at, like Dr. Jean and, and what we do here at Cheshire Wellness Center, like um, measuring heart health in, in a specific way through what we call the heart rate variability. And um, Dr. Jean, Dr. Matt, if you want to elaborate on anything, you're welcome to. Um, but I did pull up um, just like an abbreviated understanding of what the um, heart rate variability is all about. And just to kind of keep it in simple terms, um, this is from um, Harvard uh, Medical, I believe medical school, but it's just, it's just an understanding, a very simple way to understand how heart rate variability works. And it's, it's simply a measure of the variation in time between each heart rate, heartbeat. The variation is controlled by a primitive part of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. That's what you know controls and coordinates your organs, your glands, your breathing, energy levels, everything that, that happens automatically. Because thank God, if we had to think about breathing every second, we wouldn't do it. And so, um, so it works regardless of our desire and regulates among other things, our heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, and digestion, everything. Um, the ANS, the again, autonomic nervous system is subdivided into two large components. You have your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system, basically your fight or flight and your rest and digest response in the body. And they're actually tethered together. And I know we've talked about this, but I just wanted to, to recap. And so the brain is con constantly processing information in the region called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus through the autonomic nervous system sends signals through the rest of the body, either to stimulate or relax different functions. <clears throat> it responds not only to a poor night, of, poor night of sleep or a sour interaction with your boss, but, it, but also to exciting news, like you got engaged or you had a delicious healthy meal or, or, or to that delicious healthy meal you had for lunch. So our body handles all kinds of stimuli and life goes on. However, if we have persistent, what is this? Um, stress responses such as poor sleep, um, an unhealthy diet, dysfunctional relationships, currently isolation and solitude um, and lack of exercise, this balance may be disrupted and your fight or flight response is shifted into overdrive. So this particular test that we do um, in our office, you can actually see that's the device right there, right here on the counter. You put your hand, your left hand in it and through skin conductance, skin temperature and your heart rate, it measures your variability. And so it really, you know, ask the question, are you handling stress well? And is it contributing to um, putting more tension or not enough tension on your um, heart health, your cardiovascular system? So it's a really good measuring tool um, to really see what, what your system is doing. And I think it's kind of pivotal right now, understanding like when it talks about the isolation and solitude and dysfunctional relationships, we're stuck in a really weird time right now. And, and what's interesting is that we've, we've measured it for a ton of people and people who are on like antidepressants, anti-anxiety uh, medications actually don't have a very, it's not, it doesn't read bad or as a poor response because what I always say, I was like, well, good news, your medication is doing what it's supposed to do. But if you weren't on medication, where do you think you would actually fall on this chart? And people would be like, oh. Right. So something to think about, you know, like being a reality check um, as to do you want to be on the medications for the rest of your life or do you want to give yourself a fighting chance to be able to handle what needs to be handled in this day and age? It's funny that they uh, describe the autonomic nervous system as primitive. When I look at it, it's like amazing, yeah. you know, it's yeah, like right? primitive. <laughs> Okay. But don't you I think guess, the most amazing things are primitive because they're they're <clears throat> foundational? I guess yeah. That's I guess it, you know, in that it's been there, you know, as a as a sort of building to the more, yeah. um, you know. Well, it's developed within the first functions. eighteen days of life, so it is the most primitive of yeah. of what we 
have in our systems. And it's a little telling. <laughs> right. So what I find interesting is what you're talking about is sort of like the function of the heart here and now. Um, and then I think Allison would be talking about that too. Uh, because the therapies that you guys do are whatever the nerve, the nervous system and all of that kind of stuff that impact the heart. Another, uh, and Allison, I'd like to hear from you on that, but also, uh, you know, there's the whole other aspect of cardiovascular health, which is your arteries and your blood and all of that. And, and cardiovascular health, if somebody lives till they're 120, eventually it's going to be cardiovascular health that will get them because the hoses just wear out over time. And so what I would talk about also, and maybe this is great for our next session, or I think we have a guest next time, but for another session is the cardiovascular, how do we maintain the collagen in the arteries so that it doesn't break down? What is the role of cholesterol? What is the non-role of cholesterol? What really causes damage to the arteries that needs to be patched up? What is working, what doesn't work and why? why? Um, so I would speak to that. Yeah, yeah. You know. it's, it's interesting you say that, I, just, just what you're talking about and, um, and in this article as well, it's like, why would you check the heart rate variability? Um, it's, it's very interesting to see how, it, how the autonomic nervous system is imbalanced. So if a person's system is more fight or flight mode, the variation between the sequence heartbeats is gonna be lower. And if one is more in more of a relaxed state, the, heart, the variation between beats are gonna be high. So in other words, the healthier the autonomic system is, the faster you're able to switch gears and show more resilience and flexibility. So this is, this is just pertaining to what you're saying. And they were saying over the past few decades, research has shown a relationship between low heart rate variability and worsening depression or anxiety. And low heart rate variability is, is even associated with an increased risk of death and cardiovascular disease, which is you know, the number one cause. And it's, it's usually preventable. Most of the time, cardiovascular disease is preventable. And so um, it just goes on to, to say that people who have high HRV um, may have a greater cardiovascular fitness and be more resilient to stress. And it may also provide personal feedback about your lifestyle and help motivate those who are considering taking steps towards a healthier life. And it's fascinating to see how heart rate variability changes as you in incorporate more mindfulness, meditation, sleep, and especially physical activity. So for those who love data as a numbers, this is a nice way to track your nervous system in reacting not only to the environment, but to your own emotion, emotions, thoughts, and feelings, which is what Dr. Jean was talking about earlier, how our, our negative, um, one, and even Allison, I think has mentioned this, like our negative thoughts are toxic over time. And how is that playing out on our, on our whole system? And it makes me always think of um, Dr. Emoto who does the water um, crystals, like, you know, the negative talk and the positive talk to the, um, to the water. And he puts like good words and bad words on, on different bottles of water. And then over time puts it under a microscope and, and looks at the variations of the water molecules. And like the positives ones look like snowflakes and beautiful crystals. And then the negative ones look like, I don't know, like I think bogs and like, you know, gross swampy water and it's brown and green and it looks all gnarly. Like, and if we're made up of you know, somewhere around 75% of water in our body, and we're constantly draining ourselves with negative thoughts and, and toxins and, you know, bad foods and, you know, physical stress and whatnot, whether it's finances or life or traffic, it doesn't matter what it is. It, it really is impacting our system. And, and over time, that could also be the contributing factor to the cardiovascular health. It, it, it that does all, and, and again, <clears throat> Cardiovascular health is, is, is multifaceted. It's not just the heart muscle. So the things that you're really talking about for the most part are how your ticker is pumping. Mm -hmm. But most cardiovascular incidents have to do with blockages in the arteries. Okay, so that- comes, And why? Right, that comes why down with, to- Right. Why with that? Because if, if your autonomic nervous system is not functioning at its best, 
that's that's where the blockages are going to start to happen because they're well, not getting the signal to continue to no, 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 generate. No, no, no. no, I would say, I would just say the bigger thing and Linus Pauling, this was his big thing, the vitamin C Nobel laureate. Um, collagen breaks down like it does. People get wrinkles, their eyes, they get dry eye. Collagen in the body breaks down. They've now got joint problems and things like that. So um, that doesn't have to do with heart rate variability. That's a huge part for the heart itself. When it comes to the arteries, we're damaging them with just time. Uh, somebody once said, if you just stepped on a garden hose, every minute, every, you know, once a minute or whatever, and you go on and on and on and on and on, that is going to become damaged. And so just your arteries by having to pump so many times a minute, every minute, every hour, now we're going on 60, 70, 80 years, and you're doing that, it is going to become damaged. What do you do to, to stop that damage? You replace the collagen. So his big thing was vitamin C. I use things like um, MSM powder, restoring the collagen. Because if you actually have collagen breakdown, now you've got a scab, you've got, you've got a, a crevice, you've got a damaged area and our inflammatory um, in diet, our inflammatory vegetable oils, right? Instead of good saturated fats, which people think are so bad for cardiovascular health, which is just the opposite. Very inflammatory. So you have these lesions and they start to make um, crevices, they're, they're like uh, damp, like you cut yourself, right? And you need to make a scab. So this, what is a scab? The scab is called plaque. And plaque is mostly made of calcium deposit. People are told, if they're told to do supplements, it's calcium. Most people have way too much calcium. It's just not going where it needs to go. Calcium, it's bound together with, you know, a few other things. Cholesterol is a very low part of that. And it's basically patching you up so that you don't just burst and die of a, a hemorrhage. Um, so some of the foundational things for the arteries are to keep the arteries supple and smooth have to do with keeping that collagen um, youthful. So, so you're not, to, yeah. I ask you a question on that. Um, sure. one, there's a, so as this makes its way into our consciousness, there's um, plenty of marketing conglomerates out there that are aware of that too. And so there's collagen, um, supplements and bars and everything else showing up on the shelves now. Um, what are your opinions on the collagen supplements and do you see any benefit in that? So my preference is to go for the, the lowest route, which is MSM. It's organic sulfur, it's powder, it's very inexpensive. Um, with vitamin C, a perfect combination for you to generate your own collagen. Uh, there are many collagen supplements out there and, and that's fine. Um, they're usually pricey, whatever. I really love Susanna Camphouse's. She's right here in Keene of Totem Boss. We carry her chews and I think Allison does too. They're a great oh, yeah. collagen product, but I do agree with you like anything else, you know, the supplement industry is full of hype and, and marketing as well. But I, I'm just going to say foundational. We look at people with cardiovascular disease one of the big things is high homocysteine. That goes to an MTHFR defect in the C677T allele. So high homocysteine causes uh, hyper blood clotting. So for things like that, we can use proteolytic enzymes like serapeptase and natokinase to keep the fibrin dissolved so the blood is fine. Um, instead, people go to their doctor and they're prescribed a, a statin drug for cholesterol, which that's not even the problem. Um, and that comes with a lot of negative side effects for their health. So there are things that we can do to keep our blood thin, hopefully, to keep our, um, our arteries and our veins supple and smooth. We can use um, bioflavonoids such as quercetin and diosmin, things like that, to, and vitamin C, you know, along with vitamin C to keep the integrity of the vessels um, intact. And so there's, there's so much more to heart health than just the heart, um, but the heart is a huge part of it. And I think uh, you guys with what you're doing with the hands-on and the needles and things like that are like huge for that whole thing. And, and in that whole thing, let's talk about the vagus nerve, right? The vagus nerve, which controls the things like you're talking about Tisa, the emotions and the heart rate. Mm -hmm. Yep, we just had a, a class last night and just to pull out some of the 
you know, the main point from that is, you know, right back to the stress response and, you know, the toxicity that we're talking about, you know, the earlier this morning, I mean, all of that plays a huge role um, in how this is going to play out later on, especially when it comes into the heart health and being able to access and um, sort of harness and detox um, those sort of more toxic, you know, responses, wherever they're coming from is plays out huge. And so of course we see uh, tremendous improvements in cardiovascular health. And, you know, in our office, we look at the interface between the neurological and the cardiovascular, that's our, um, our scope. So, you know, we see huge um, uh, improvement in that. And um, when you start looking at it through this kaleidoscope of all of these different rays of this, you know, these disciplines and how they coalesce, I mean, it's just, there's a lot of um, positive survival value <laughs> available to you with all these disciplines. It goes started. way beyond the American Health Asso Heart Association. Way beyond. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, get a lay of the land over there. Cool. And then um, start digging. <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't know the, the heart is uh, a lot of neural tissue too. Yeah. Uh, 60% as I understand. So uh, it's, it's, it's more than, as you say, just a pump. It has a lot to do with our intuitions and our knowings. And, um, you know, I once heard that... Uh, your heart has so many beats for life. So you know, I don't know if that's true, but you know, if we're stressed all the time and we're boom, 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 boom maybe we get there sooner. But I, you know, I think it's like that. If you're in that stress physiology, like Becky was saying, you're stepping on the hose a lot more. And so like anything, you're taking a holistic approach, which means, yeah, you want to support your body with those nutrients that you need to, to develop and you know, constantly replace and, and keep up to date with your collagen. You know that, that keeps things um, supple. At the same time, you don't want to step on the hose as much. Like you try to, you know, try to not do that as much. And and it's the, it's the combination of all these things together that that yields you the best results. And then also understanding that, um, you know, our stress just from a mental emotional space, there's a huge impact on our organic health, um, you know, certainly with the heart. And there's, there's so much to that. We're not paying attention to our heart and our knowings and our feelings and our, um, our intuitions. Um, it does affect the physical heart as well from the other end of it. So like back when I mean, there's a whole thing. out. It's just a huge, you know, mushroom of stuff. I have to say, I make, we make a product for people in grief and it's called comfort and joy, but it's all, Medicines, um, hawthorn berry, motherwort, um, mimosa bark. These are all, I didn't know that there was neural tissue in that. That's brand new to me, Jean. So that's so interesting. But this is the whole thing. These plants that work for the physical heart work for the emotional heart too. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's all the connection connected. there. It's all connected. So you important. need another hour for this one. <laughs> <laughs> In, uh, hours. Real quick, <laughs> in, in Chinese medicine, we talk about the heart kidney access and it's kind of like your central access. So you have your fire and your water is like the main sort of like uh, central access in your body. So the heart is the fire element and it govern, it's like the most ethereal type of chi or energy. So it's your thought pattern. So any type of negative thoughts or things like that. And it's also the collective consciousness that's kind of like just at an ethereal level. And then the, it's that connection with the kidneys and the water element, which is your adrenals. And that would be your nervous system. And so that center line, which I think the vagus nerve is very involved in sort of communicating the two, um, is often disrupted and a lot of times like trauma will you'll see that with people that have had um, some type of like trauma or shock incident and in those cases you always want to work on like that heart kidney access you could do like the fire points on the kidney meridian and then the water points on the heart meridian and kind of like bring the water into the fire and it kind of cools down the heat that's just kind of like rising up and they're disconnected and you'll see that, that also in people when they have um, their, wow. you can check their abdomen and you'll feel the, um, the lower half of the abdomen is very, very cold and the upper half is really hot. And that's a sign that it's kind of like drifted away and you wanna bring the, 
bring the heat down into the, the kidneys, down into the lower area, and it'll kind of root everything down. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's there are cool. so many ways that, you know, I mean, for one, for our audience, there's one on one side of it, like, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming because there's so many things that could go wrong. But there are also so many ways that we can approach tweaking things, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Alice was just describing how the Chinese medicine school of thought and how you can, you know, approach it in that way. And you can approach it from a toxicity way. You can approach it from a, you know, nutritional or supplemental way. You can approach it from a nerve system way. So that's good news because there's lots of things that everybody can do. And the more things that you can do, the better off you're going to be. And, um, you know, so it can be overwhelming with all the things against us, so to speak, all the things that are putting pressure on us, but there are very, there are so many different options and so many different ways that you can continue to elevate your health. And it's not like any one of them is the, the end all of all things. It's like, this is just another way to enhance your body's adaptability. And, you know, your, your diet is another way and, and you can, you can add to your bucket constantly, um, you know, in amidst of all these different things that we have to deal with. Yeah. This is so That's great. I, I learned so much. I know we say that every week, but like, this was really great. Thank you. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to, uh, so we get, we have, a, we're starting a new format where, uh, you know, on the third uh, Friday of the month, we're going to have a guest. So um, who wants to announce our guest for next week? I, I will. Yeah, it was, um, I sort of arranged this guest. Um, it's going to be Sharon LaFlame. Her business is Creating Serenity. She's local here in the Monadnock region. Um, Sharon's just a really beautiful person. First of all, she's, um, just got such a peaceful sort of energy about her. Um, she's, a, has been a yoga instructor for a very long time. Um, but she has gone into somatic experiencing, which is abbreviated S E. And it's a way that to address trauma that gets stored in the body and, especially at a young age, because apparently as I hope Sharon will elaborate on the nervous system is sort of not myelinated or not ready to sort of like adapt to stress um, when you're at a younger age. Mm -hmm. and so it kind of gets stored there and she uses SE and sure. somatic means body. So she sort of does her magic so that people can sort of really experience how and where in their body that trauma is manifesting. And then she releases that. And she, I think she's just such a perfect person to do this work. Um, because it's not, it's a very slow and gentle way, but it's especially very effective. And from her website, she says, um, the underlying survival energy is safely, slowly released, increasing a sense of peace and serenity through compassionate self-awareness as he offers healing. And she offers tools like meditation, conscious breath work, imagery, and body awareness to bring the nervous system into relaxation. So wow. I'm excited to well, hear about it from her. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's going to make for a very interesting conversation, I think. Yeah. It'll tie awesome. in really well with what we do. So that's two weeks from today, correct? February 19th. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us. This has been fun for us. I hope it's been infor and informative for us. I always learn so much from my colleagues. Um, yeah. Love Great. that we get to do this. Yeah. Beautiful. Right, Have a great you. couple of weeks. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Here. Bye. Bye.